recording? Has that come up on your screen? <laughs> yeah, it says recording has started. Perfect. So to start with, obviously, I know you, but could you just explain a little bit about your background, where you work and where you've been before? Sure. Um, I mean, do you need my name and stuff as well? Yes, please. So um, I'm Stefania Caramadula. Uh, I'm currently the social media supervisor at My Teresa. Um, My Teresa is a luxury fashion retailer um, and it's actually based in Munich. Um, my background, my background, um, my background is mainly into luxury fashion. Um, so my degree was digital marketing and then going, going into the market, um, I started working for this brand called Sphere Webster, um, which was mainly, um, luxury accessories, uh, for women and kids, um, Susan Bugs particularly. Um, so I started my career there and then I moved to Browns, uh, who's acquired by Farfetch, again, a uh, fashion luxury retailer, uh, which has I just technically like spent my mid-level slash senior years there. Um, and now I've moved to my Teresa. Um, is there, did you ask me anything else? Forgot. That's no, that's all good. Thank you. And then the next question is, what are your initial opinions on pre-loved fashion? Um, I would say in terms of industry opinion, I think it's something that is on a fast rise uh, and everyone um, and everyone is looking at it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, like all my friends, all my friends, my circle and I mean, the, even the company I work for, um, they're looking into ways of how they can incorporate with brands that um are into that industry or um how they can create collections and work with uh brands that they actually uh, mainly do this um like upcycle um fashion either is it's ready to wear or accessories um mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of my own personal opinion uh i do love it i do have pre-loved um items um, I started actually um, buying that when I was around, I would say, in my 20s. Um, mm -hmm. When I started, like, looking at pre-loved items, usually in, like, vintage shops. Um, mm -hmm. Mainly because it was just unique pieces you couldn't find anyone else. And I was technically the only one, the only one to wear them. So. Yeah of like like that feeling and especially like when you start uh into like being into fashion which I think that's what that's when I started like shaping my like style and wants and needs um yeah what I wanted at that time was like something that is unique and no one else would have so every time we were going on holiday with my friends um we would like visit like all the vintage shops we could find mm -hmm. um yeah and it's actually like a lot of fun um and then I started looking at pre-loved luxury items uh when I was like a bit older of course like when you start making your own money uh and you want to invest in pieces but at the same time you can't afford like spending like 3k on a bag yeah um, I think this is like a good way like of start um getting those luxury pieces and start building your own let's say collection wardrobe uh, yeah and now I have so many friends that they're like so into like vestiaire which is like popping at the moment um and yeah like in general like into this pre-loved luxury um industry um yeah, which is actually huge well, yeah you've kind of answered my next question as well because I was going to ask you from like a personal point of view um, would you buy pre-loved because my target generation would kind of be like generation z and millennials so I guess that's kind of like you and your friendship group um, but you've kind of answered that one and then from like the point of view of um, my Teresa have they done anything with pre-love fashion there? Yeah so they did a, collabor a collaboration with Vestiaire um, literally like a month ago um, mm. so this collaboration involved the fact that um, if uh, luxury clients uh, and like my Teresa's luxury clients specifically were to sign up with Vestiaire, 
yeah. and, and start selling their pre-loved items, uh, they would get a discount code for my Teresa. Okay, cool. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, so technically you sell your previous items and you get a discount by new, um, which is kind of like incorporating uh, like the pre-loved industry with, yeah. an, with an industry my company is like really keen on, selling new collections and selling new items. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like an incentive from their like luxury, like the VAC clients. Um, to yeah sell potentially something they don't need and buy more <laughs> oh you yeah, know that's interesting and then the next question is more about like rental fashion is that something that you've ever worked with or that you'd think about like personally renting like formal wear um and as well as there like any issues that you think like a few people I've interviewed have said that they would be a little bit hesitant because of like hygiene concerns or like the like practicality of returning the items so quickly and stuff but how do you feel about rental so I have actually uh worked with a project when I was at Browns um so we collaborated with a U.S. um rental company which I don't remember the name at the moment I don't remember the name but I'll I'll email you the name um and so the so how we worked with them was technically uh, we built a pop-up within the store mm -hmm. and people could come and uh, rent the um, the piece of clothing. It, it could be less than a week. It didn't need to be a week. It could be based on event as well. So yeah. you could potentially rent it for like, a, for like a day or two days, go out and then return it technically. Um, and how the collaboration worked was technically... Um, this company was buying brown stock um, yeah. and then they would use it to to they would use it in in rental um, in rental situations okay. so so we collaborated with them in this way and then we we'll built a pop-up within store so you could potentially come and check out new collections and and buy the products or you could you you could visit the the corner of the store that you could actually like rent um like pre-loved items oh, let, sorry rent um rental clothing yeah uh, only clothing not uh shoes or uh bags so it was only mm -hmm. ready to wear uh -huh. so the thing it makes more sense because it's harder to um to get into the rental business of that particular shoes bags is yeah. quite easy but shoes yeah. are really trickier um so yeah so we did that with them um, i would say for around a month um and then it kind of helps you like build the clientele in like both ways like we yeah. had the rent they have the opportunity to just go into the shop and see if they like something um and yeah and then loyal customer of browns could actually rent something for like a day or something yeah no, that's cool so it was like a temporary pop-up yeah, yeah yeah it was like a temporary pop-up um um so th and that was the one of kind of um project that we did that they did together um mainly because it was like a u.s company and it wasn't really aware they were they weren't really popular in europe uh or the uk so it was like kind of like an opportunity for the brand um um so yeah that was that was it but i mean i mean this the company still has this collaboration with brown of uh, of like buying stock uh it's just like the copy the is not available anymore so it's and so then, now yeah and then i mean it, it's it's on, it's not it's on the basis of um it's not about pre-loved fashion or like rentals but they did have the service at browns where they they worked with a repair company mm -hmm. um so it's, it's again around this concept of like holding to like all things or like repairing yeah. them or like yeah, find new ways to use them where they used this um yeah like repair company and they're collaborating with them constantly and technically if any clients has like i don't know old pair gucci bag or an old pair of gucci shoes um, oh, right. you technically like give it to them and they make um they remake them and they fix like any like i don't know stitches or leather 
and they're actually um, official partner with luxury brands. So mm-hmm. they have, for example, for your Louboutin shoes, they have the color, the it, like the verified official color of Louboutin. So it's yeah. like they operate only by fixing like luxury items and they do brand collaborations as well. So they have the actual um, repairing tools, let's say, um, to do so, because obviously that's really important. Yeah, no, it's the same sort of idea of like extending a product's life cycle rather than like just buying new and getting rid of old stuff, isn't it? Like Exactly, which, is, yeah, which is, comes in the concept of upcycling, which is yeah. technically what pre-loved fashion is all about. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then the next question is like from your experience when you have done these sort of collaborations with Browns and My Teresa, um, which age group and sort of demographic would be most interested in this concept? I, I don't think it's limited to a generation or age um, based on the fact that the projects I've done are so uh, diverse and so different every single time. Um, like, as I said, like the rental company it could be anything, it could be from, I don't know, you're more you know, like in your 20s, for example, you will go to an event and if you're in your 50s and you want to go to the opera or whatever um also like the selection of clothing wasn't limited so um like the ready to wear selection wasn't limited to a specific age uh, or type of person um so it has like a broad variety um same with the repairs it doesn't matter or like what, what, what age you are and then we'll, like while working at brands we have done so many collaborations of designers upcycling their own um like old um stock or we have worked with designers that they actually create new stock from old stock and these are quite like young designers um that speak to that um to that generation z z let's say right um so yeah i don't think it's like limited to yeah, for example, like Con Ives, he just finished. He just finished uni, um, um, and he did this his first collaboration with Browns, and it was technically like upcycled T-shirts, um, ripped, ripped, and reached it, reached it together, um, which was super cool, and it could be worn um, by anyone being from I don't know fourteen, sixteen. Yeah. To- anyone that could support like a more alternative cool style in their like 40s 50s whatever cool okay so yeah it's definitely a really wide market and I think you're right with like the product range you can kind of adapt it to different markets as well what sort of products you're getting in is going to like determine the customer um so the next question is it's kind of a broad question but you can just like touch on whatever you want but like in luxury fashion what are you finding the best ways are to like market are you finding social media is still the most successful or like pop-up shops or like I don't know if if there's different platforms are you finding like video content or TikTok is better um I would say that it's a mix of everything um and there's no I don't know ticket to success like you do one thing and that's the only thing you can do um I mean nowadays pretty much everything is it's so digitalized um and there's so ways to promote something from social media to email marketing to SEO um to I don't know to in-store activations to pop-ups I think everything plays a specific part and also it depends on the market you're working with Um, for example I don't know China is really into uh, like story events and looking at a product up close but at the same time they're so into like social media with WeChat and Weibo and their own version like TikTok Um, so I think you kind of need to be everywhere um, at the same time and Mm -hmm. you need to be able to translate offline to online and online to offline Uh, I think that's that's a really key factor there like if you do an event and if you do like a story event or a pop-up how can you bring your digital community yeah um, into this because I think that's the most important thing and it's something that I would say social media has 
has expanded a lot because now social media, like you can have followers, I don't know, in Argentina and in um, Italy. So you kind of like need to speak to all of them um, in order for them to engage with you, in order for them to uh, to build a relationship with you. You just need to be able to, for example, if you do an event in Paris, and you, you need to be able to, to kind of like bring them together in this journey. Yeah. Um, and and round up everything nicely, but I think every single part plays its role, um, and I I wouldn't say that one can do without the other. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Social media gives you a lot of spotlight and visibility. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say that it would be the only su- success factor for for like a business or how to market products because. Again, if you're referring to a broader age group of customers, uh, there are different touch points, different channels for for each uh, generation. For example, TikTok is all about Gen Z, uh, and then Instagram is all about millennials, and then I would say Facebook it's has started to become more older generation kind of channel. So I think what you need to do is you just need to adjust your strategy based yeah. on your age group and based on your on your on your followers in each channel and then find the right way to communicate technically the same message in different ways yeah um, but yeah this cool. is- thank you um, and then you've kind of already touched on a few of these um, points but who would in your opinion be um like Zoop's biggest competitors so we mentioned vestiaire but have you got anything else in mind that would sort of be competing in the rental and pre-loved market for fashion um, I mean, currently, I think everyone is trying to tap in this market with one way or another, like look at Farfetch yeah. um, and how they're trying to incentivize their uh, their clients to actually send old stock to them and then sell, sell them through, through the platform. Um, I think Vestier has saved a lot of how purchases are done um yeah. especially through the past i don't know a couple of years um they have grown massively and i think they will continue to do so um i think in the future what i would see is i would see more of like a like weird collaborations like i don't know like my Teresa like collaborating with vestiaire which is so, something like a bit, a bit unexpected so i feel like we will see this kind of like collaborations in the future these unexpected collaborations or even i don't know even the competitor collaborations mm-hmm. um kind of like working together uh in a sense uh, i mean look at again look at farfetch and the fact that i don't know um a lot of like luxury stores stores sell the, in within the platform, but actually, far, far, like Farfetch is a luxury platform. It sells as uh, mm-hmm. as brands, and it sells. It has the stock to sell the products. Um, so I think it's going to be yeah a, a combination of unique collaborations, uh, but definitely like pre loved items, vintage items, are definitely going to be key um, for any particular business in the future. Yeah. And I think they need to just find their own angle of how to tackle that market in order to be relatable um, to the customers. Cool. Yeah, sort of every brand is working towards that direction, I think, especially in luxury fashion. Um, how do you think the pandemic has affected the luxury market? Um, I would say that... I mean, in in terms of like performance and and people being interested in luxury in the luxury market, I don't think it had an a, like a negative impact. Mm-hmm. I think how how pand- the pandemic has changed the luxury fashion is that maybe people are more conscious on their buy, yeah. um, like they they select specifically what they want and what they need. Um, they're more savvy with their purchases. But also, I think in terms of like the business perspective, I think sustainability has played like a huge factor um, mm-hmm. throughout the pandemic. So I think uh, brands are now looking on more sustainable practices, 
on how they can create collections that that speak to audiences that are, that are interesting in sustainability and they're interesting in like a better future environmentally um how do they ethically source um like i don't know they're like fabrics or um like how who works for the brand and how if they're like ethically correct uh opposite to their employees um so i i think it has changed it has changed the industry in that way like p- people had more um time to think what's actually what actually works um they had time to to consider like what how the fast pace to have like fast paces in life actually um like affect them what's important i think yeah i think there were there was a lot of time for reflection yeah uh, and because yeah because people had a lot of time to reflect they started to be more picky and um they're starting to look more into brands and what are the brands about um, so i think in my opinion in it's changed that um, yeah a lot I mean obviously there have been brands struggling um uh there could have been like businesses store and stores specifically that would struggle through pandemic but I think whoever was in in looks for fashion and had a digital presence and had a good digital presence I think they kind of like survived um yeah. so far um the yeah. pandemic um but yeah I, I would I would my main point would be that people just had more time to think, reevaluate yeah. and choose what they really want, um, which I think is here to stay. I mean, obviously to an extent, people tend to forget. Um, so mm-hmm. once we're like all out of this crazy um, couple of years, um, I think people will just start to forget how it was before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, because and you know, humans are are um, creatures of habit. So once we get again into like a completely different mindset and a completely different and uh, like daily life, I think to an extent it might be quite forgotten. But I don't think it's gonna ever leave. Yeah. Um, especially with the younger generation, I can see like the younger generation like really into like sustainable fashion. Um, like war problems, like environmental problems, like ethical problems. Um, I, th- I, th- I see them like really interested into this. So that's why I think like specifically pre-loved fashion would be something that will hugely expand um, yeah. the next, I would say five to 10 years. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think it's it's hard not to really because we saw this stuff about how like there not being so many planes in the sky and like the reverse on global warming just from like a few months of the pandemic I think it was kind of made aware to everyone that like what we can do if we're just a bit more sustainable so yeah I think the younger generation definitely won't forget what they saw for the last couple of years and I think fashion is a massive part of that so yeah I think you're right I think um the luxury market's probably benefited a little bit more than like high street brands I, I've done a lot of research into like the rich and how they were like affected on sort of like with jobs and their salaries and stuff during the pandemic and I think they were probably affected the least so the luxury market's probably been one of the luckiest yeah exactly and I mean it was always it, it, it's again it, it's always based in a clientele that has power uh yeah. Whereas like high street fashion is, is, I don't know, it's, it's to the average person, to, to, to the worker, uh, which technically like struggled like the most throughout the pandemic. So it makes more than sense that um, those kind of like brands that were tapping into that market kind of like lose, lost ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas luxury fashion already speaks to powerful, powerful people with really high income um so yeah in 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 that perspective they didn't lose the the power to buy let's yeah. say no definitely cool and then the next question is kind of a big question so you can kind of just pick one point if you want um but what would you say are like the current biggest problems in the fashion industry so like 
people have mentioned like fast fashion or um like the lives of factory workers but what would you say is like the biggest problem in the fashion industry um i mean i would i would say that luxury fashion has become to an extent kind of like fast fashion in terms of there's so many capsules um yeah. so many exclusives at the moment um so i have seen like brands trying to like cut down their like uh their collections per year because they they i don't know they reached to an extent like i remember like when i was at sphere website we had like what seven eight collections in a year which is insane which was like like a few years back was like what two per year maybe three um and now like, everyone is is creating like more and more capsules and, and exclusives and even more capsules um so I think that's definitely a problem. Um, it, it does speak to like like overconsumption, and it, it it kind of like takes away from the sustainability factor. Um, I mean, if you say that oh I'm a brand and I'm going to do only two collections per year, but then you, you go ahead and you work with like eight retailers on exclusives, mm-hmm. that's technically a lie. Um, yeah. So I do think that's. I, that's 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 a big factor within uh, luxury fashion. Um, another thing is how do they dispose the items um, after a collection is done? That's a huge problem still in luxury fashion because obviously they're they are products and items that they cost a lot of money, and once they're not needed or wanted anymore, it's just hard to sell them on a lower price because that's uh, diminishing the brand. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of brands, I mean, to the likes of like, I don't know, Burberry or um, who else was it? Uh, Prada, I think it was like in this huge incident where they would like, I don't know, burn yeah. or destroy like old stock. Um, so that, so yeah, I, I, I do believe that new brands and new brands in the in the luxury industry are trying to be like really sustainable and have like really good practices but i think the big names within the industry are still far from um being sustainable and far from actually working towards um more sustainable luxury fashion i mean if you ask me i quite believe the word luxury and sustainable is extremely contradictive mm-hmm. um yeah um but yet, yet again you 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 work with people that have different expectations they have private jets right they're like flying it they're, they're flying around the world they need the packaging with the insane tissue paper uh mm-hmm. that's extremely luxury like to an extent it's kind of like utopic to say that luxury fast is going to be like absolutely sustainable but there yeah. are definitely brands out there like trying their best to do their best about the environment and I truly believe that um but at the same time I would like to see actual change and not campaign change you know the fact that you you say that oh this collection is super sustainable and we've up- upcycled one we've upcycled these bags and then you keep continue making 30 capsules a year and your collections and comp- continue to like selling like new product I think that's kind of like yeah ironic yeah yeah no I definitely agree it's interesting what you said about all the different capsules I think they used to be like like they used to be two a year and then I read this thing about like pretty little thing and even places like Zara and ASOS do like 52 collections a year and it just it's like every consumer constantly feel like they're out of fashion because you just buy one collection and then another one comes out so yeah and I think it's it's the same in luxury fashion like the amount of capsules releasing is just increasing and increasing and it's almost like fast fashion is just everywhere now. Exactly. Like, I, I mean, even, I don't know, even like, like brands that they say they reduce their collections, they don't really do it. Yeah. Uh, be- because like all these exclusive brand collaborations is technically the same thing. Yes, you reduced your main collections um throughout the year but you technically haven't reduced the potentially the um how much you produce which is which is the main problem like how many things do you produce and how many things of this what you produce like stay behind and can be sold after 
Mm. Um, which again, you see like, I don't know, you see businesses like Farfetch selling to TK Maxx. Yeah. You know, all the Farfetch stock like goes to TK Maxx and then it sells, it sells through uh, TK Maxx, which is like a outlet store, right? But I mean, again, not everything can be can be sold through that stream. So it's it's just a shame with what's actually happening with the stock that's never sold. Uh, and it, it's it's silly to think that on this only applies to fast fashion and to companies like Zara and Misguided. Yeah, obviously they have potentially even larger quantities, but that doesn't mean that luxury fashion is any better. Yeah, no, that's a good point, definitely. And then um, kind of my last question is just like, do you have any other recommendations? I feel like there's any like major points that I've missed out on um, like sort of thinking about Zoops as well. Would you have any recommendations for their marketing or like just any tips of stuff I could include? Um, I think they would definitely need to be stronger um, on, a, on a digital level. Mm-hmm. Um, either if it's like with their own like digital um, presence or again like my trees and Farfetch like collaborating with other pre-loved uh, businesses um, for example they could even potentially sell through Farfetch I don't know yeah. do this collaboration with them and sell through them or they could even like I don't know sell through Vestia or do like a collaboration with Vestia um, something else that they would like that they would do is obviously as I said pre-loved fashion is all about exclusivity and the fact that pieces are unique like you can get a bag that was available 20 years ago but it's not yet so it's like building that branding around um, exclusive and unique um but also like even making products exclusive and unique for example they could work with like i don't know artists that could um like lay art on top of like clothes or work with like designers that would customize those pieces Mm -hmm. further um in order to up the resale value to be honest um because i mean if you have like a really famous artist I don't know, Yoyo Kusama, like do like on one of his like like do one of her like um famous like prints on it, and you could basically like what sell it for like two, three K more um in an instant. Yeah. So there's there's ways to to make your products more unique and more exclusive in order to up the price. Um I mean, finding unique products is already extremely difficult, but I think there's a way like to customize them. Or you could do jewelry, um, you could find like jewelry designers and then they can technically redesign your existing jewelry um, in a unique way, you know, like pieces you might have from the, I don't know, 80s or the 90s and yeah. then kind of like reimagined and redesigned in the, for the current um like trend or interest um so yeah I, I would say like this this is this is the the road I would imagine that I if I owned a pre-loved like company um I would do, I would go down with I would just try to make it like extremely exclusive yeah that's that's what everyone is like looking for yeah, um, yeah how to be people, unique people want things that other people don't have which is mm. Yeah, like exclusive um cool I think that's all of my questions unless you have anything else to add but I think that's covered everything thank you no problem cool let me just stop recording <laughs>